Well, we've been in this series called Here's Your Sign, and we talked about uh, the stop sign. Uh, we, we talked about there's some things we must stop doing. These are God's financial signs for us. And then last week, we talked about yield. You got to yield some things to the Lord in your life and in your finances, and when you do, God will bless you. And then today is the last message in this, and I actually have never preached this type of message before. This message is about what responsibility we have to teach our children and our grandchildren. As you're going to see from the text today, this is not just the responsibility of parents of young children. This is the responsibility of parents. This is the responsibility of grandparents. And this is also the responsibility of church leaders and church members Uh, God is very clear of how he wants to do that. So today, uh, our sign is slow children. Now, I think that may be an unfortunate sign because it lacks punctuation. You know what I'm saying? Because if you read it the way it is on the sign, it seems like that in that neighborhood, there are very slow children and they cannot move quickly. And therefore, you know, they're warning you that these kids are really, really slow. Well, that's unfortunate because uh, the sign is actually, uh, it's not reflecting their athletic prowess, okay, Uh, but rather it is uh, warning the driver to use caution, care, and intentionality. Use caution, care, and intentionality. In the same way, God wants us as a church in our Uh, next generation ministry, in how we lead our children and our youth and our young families and our older families. He wants us to use caution, care, and intentionality. And when we do that, I'm quite confident that God blesses us. And he blesses us not only financially, but he blesses us in that we are establishing in the next generation some principles that will serve them well and help them throughout all of their life. And so we must as a church and we must as parents and we must as grandparents, even if you don't have children, you're a member of this church, you have a responsibility to follow what the Lord is teaching us today. So today I'm going to read a very classic text. It's found in Deuteronomy chapter 6. And to the Hebrews, this text is known as the Shema. Shema, that's the Hebrew word for the word here. And this is known as the great Shema. And the reason they call it the great Shema is because it contains what every believer, what every follower of Jesus Christ, what every member of the church must heed and must do. It actually lays out a perfect outline of how we are to live our lives, whether you have children or not. And so let's read together in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 through 9. The Bible says, hear, O Israel. Now the word hear, the word Shema, it means not just to hear with your ears, but to hear with your heart. In other words, you hear it and you plan on doing it. You're not just going to say, okay, this is an option. But no, you say, whatever it is that you say, God, I am going to do. Hear, O Israel. By the way, notice he didn't say, O parents of Israel. He didn't say, O leaders of Israel. He didn't say, O those of you who are middle age, or those of you that are older, or those of you that are younger. He said, This message is to everyone. And so every one of us must take heed to this message. It says, The Lord. Our God, the Lord, is one. That's saying that God is one God. We worship one God. He is a triune God, but we're to worship Him. And God is complete and whole in Himself. And then He goes on and shows us how to express our worship, how to express our love, how to respond to this God who is one, who is unified, who is blessed, who is holy. He says, here's what you do. You shall love the Lord your God with all. Everybody say the word all. All. How much? All. How much? All. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart. Now, does that mean that 
there's no room for loving your spouse or your children. No, that's not what he's talking about. But he's saying that every part of you must love God. He said, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your might. And by the way, this, co- this covers every part of us. Uh, the might, that's your body. You're to love God with your body. In, in uh, Romans chapter 12, it talks about give your body as a living sacrifice to God. Now, what does that mean? Well, it means that you don't just have this very common thing that many people have today. Oh, yes, I love God in my heart. I don't need to go to church. I don't need to be physically present. I, I don't need to engage with other believers because I love him in my heart. That's No, he says, you love God with your body. You show up. You be a part. He says, love him with your soul. What is your soul? Well, your soul is made up of your mind, your emotions, and your decision-making ability, your intellect. So I'm to love God with my mind. In other words, I'm to put parts of my life where I'm to learn about God. I'm to give him my mind. I'm to submit and surrender my thinking to God, my mind, my fears. I'm to give that part of my life to God. I'm to love God with my emotions. Now, this is the easy part. I can love God with my emotions because when I hear a beautiful song, then I feel connected to God. When I come to a worship service, I feel connected to God. So I love him with my emotions. But wait a minute. It's not just your happy emotions. This morning in the pre-service meeting with our volunteers, I, I shared what the Bible says. In everything, give thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. This is Thanksgiving week. We ought to be thankful. But we need to learn to be thankful and to love God with my emotion. I'm to love him with my happiness, with my sadness, with my joy, with my anger. Wait a minute, how do you do that? Well, you committed all to him. By the way, anger is not a sin. It's uncontrolled anger, anger that is a sin. You can be angry at things that are happening in the world. For example, uh, when you read about uh, the sex trade and the sex slave industry that captures young girls, young women across the world, you ought to get angry about that. That's righteous indignation. Jesus got angry at the things that were being done wrong in the temple in his day. I'm to love him with my emotions. I'm to love him with my body. I'm to love him with my mind. So he says, I'm to love him with all of my heart. And then these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. We got to keep them there. We got to think about them. Do you think about God only on Sunday? Do you think about your relationship with God only in church? Or do you start your day? My suggestion to you would be before you get out of bed, you say thanks to the Lord. You begin to connect with him. Now, I do realize that some of you, uh, if you were to actually try to read the Bible or pray before you really got to work, you would just be changing positions that you're sleeping in. I, I get that. And uh, it just be alert, okay? But we're to love him with our heart. We're to keep it on our minds. And then he says, you shall teach them these principles, these things that we've learned. You shall teach them diligently to your children. And you shall talk of them when you sit in your house, and when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise. Isn't that different than what we picture in our minds about how you teach children about God? I mean, the fact is, it's important to have your kids involved in the programming of the church. I believe in that. We do that to help your children love Jesus. Just this past Wednesday, I was able to talk to two of our teenagers and prayed with them about knowing for sure that they know Jesus Christ as their Savior. We've got several people that are going to get baptized coming up in just a couple of weeks. That's a wonderful thing. But this is not describing a church service. Now, it's important to be involved, but he's talking about your normal life when you go to a football game, when you go shopping, 
when you go out as a family, when you're hanging out of the house, when you go to the beach. Every part of your life, he says, is to be wrapped up in doing this. I'm going to show you how we do this in just a moment. He says, you shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. By the way, um, the ancient Jewish people, the ancient Hebrews, they took this literally, and there were many of them that would bind what were called phylacteries that would be little boxes. Sometimes they'd bind it around their head and it would have scripture verses. Often this very verse would be in it or around their hand or they would put it on the doorpost. Here's the question. What is in your house that is reflecting Jesus Christ? You see, often we forget that it is very important that we keep God and our relationship with him front and center. Does that mean that you can only have uh, Bible verses as decor in your house? No, that would be kind of boring, in my opinion. And I love the Bible, but I, I do like art and things of that nature, okay? So, but the question is, is your home a place where God is honored? If someone were to come into your house would they know, like God was telling these ancient Hebrews, would they know that you're a believer? Kim and I, many years ago, when we have three adult children, Brittany, Brandon, and Brooke. Brooke is our youngest. She's 27. When she was in high school, she was having some very, very difficult emotion, emotional problems. And uh, she was often upset. She was often very afraid. We didn't know what in the world was going on. We discovered one day that she and her friends had brought home a Ouija board into our house. Now, you say, well, that's innocent. That's just an innocent game. You believe that if you want. But I believe that often with the things that we bring into our home, we are inviting evil spirits. We're inviting the devil himself into our home. Don't do it. We found that. I didn't give it away. I didn't throw it in the trash. We burned it. And then we literally went and anointed our house with oil. And we prayed over every room. We prayed that God would protect us and keep the enemy away. It was not long after that that our youngest daughter had an experience. One night she, she was just so terrified. Often she would see, at least she thought she saw demons in her room. And one night, not long after that, after we prayed, after we got that out of our house, I'll never forget this. She was about to go to sleep, and one night she saw a light come on in her room, begin to glow, and she said she felt as if a hand was touching her. It wasn't scary, and it was as if she heard the voice of God. Now, whether she heard it audibly or, or not, I don't know. But I do know that this experience changed her and God ministered to her and he told her that everything was going to be okay. Did you know that after that, she never again feared the things that she feared before? Now, what am I saying? I believe you ought to take this seriously. What's in your house? Is there any scripture in your house? Do you have a Bible? I realize I don't even, I, I carry a Bible up here to preach out of, but I read the Bible on my phone or on my computer most of the time. This morning I read the Bible on my computer. But, but is there a Bible in your house? Is there scripture in your house? Is there something in your house that is inviting the enemy into your house? If there is, get rid of it and take seriously what God was telling them. Because I really do believe, I don't believe that literally you have to walk around with a, a scripture verse, you know, wrapped around your wrist. I don't think you have to do that or, or around your head. But you know what I do believe? That what your home is like sets the tone for your life. And I really do believe that. Some of you this week ought to go buy a Bible verse, a scripture plaque, and put it somewhere in your home. If you don't do anything but print off a Bible verse and stick it on your mirror, I believe, and I really do believe this, and I believe the scripture teaches this, that God will bless you when you do it. And let's read the last verse there. He said, you shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. Now, in this 
text, there are five components that God uses to teach our children. And, and the command is very clear. And, and I want to give them to you very quickly because this is from the text. I'm going to make a, a, a practical application that all of us can learn from, okay? But here are the five components that God uses to teach our children and others. Number one is a dynamic relationship with God. You must have a dynamic, real relationship with God. As a parent, as a leader, as a member of the church, God says that's number one. Number two, you got to have authentic behavior. Be real. Let me ask you this question. With your kids, with your grandkids, with the people you work with, are you real? Or are you that person that nobody wants to hang around because you're so weird and you, like, you, you pretend that you've never done anything wrong. And, uh, you know, look, I believe in everything, give thanks. But if you hit your thumb with a hammer at work, maybe don't tell everybody there, oh, praise Jesus. Now, I realize God tells us to praise him in everything. But, you know, maybe you ought to be real, okay, in your relationship with God. Let people know that you're not perfect, that you're not strange, but that God has changed your life. Authentic behavior. Number three, consistent modeling. God wants us to model Christianity in front of our kids, in front of the people that we work with. That's being real. When you model the gospel, you let other people know that you're not perfect. You're not a judgmental person. By the way, in the Beatitudes and and the Sermon on the Mount, when Jesus said, uh, judge not that you be not judged, he was not saying you cannot make moral judgments. He was saying that your attitude toward others must not be that you're perfect and they're not, that you point out their sin and ignore, you know, the little speck in their eye and you got a log, a plank sticking out of yours. That's his point. Authentic behavior, modeling uh, consistent Christian living. And then number four, transparent living. Once again, this is being real. He showed them that with their daily lives, they were to do this. When they get up in the morning, when they go to bed at night, when they're walking by the way, this is normal life. Once again, I think that it's important to read scripture with your family, with your kids, but Where they learn the most is not when you sit them down and point the finger at them and teach them like a professor. That's not how they learn best or most. What they learn is how you live. That's what they learn most. And and be patient. Your, Your kids may act like they're not absorbing anything, but they are. For good or bad. God says we're to have transparent lives. And then the fifth thing that he tells us in this text is that we're to have spiritual protection. How are you protecting your family spiritually? What are you doing to make sure that uh, you pray over your family and you pray that hedge of protection around them? You call on God to help you. Are you doing that? We must do this as a church. We must do this as grandparents. We must do this as parents. We must do this as people who don't have children. God has called us to model this kind of Christian living, and particularly for the next generation. It is critical that we understand that, that as a church, we pour into the next generation, or in the next generation, this church will not exist. And so, I want to just kind of teach you how to take this holistic application that I'm going to show you today. Obviously, God is interested in the whole person, not just the spiritual side. Now, there are a lot of parents that get the spiritual side uh, separated from the practical side. They think that going to church, put your kids in church, that's all you need. Well, that's not all you need. They need it during the week as well. And so I want to show you how to make this Um, this practical plan, I'm going to take it a step further and we're going to focus in on how do you teach your kids about finances? How do you teach them? Obviously the church, their relationship with God. Uh, So how do we teach our kids about money? Number one, you teach your children the value of work. 
I realize that may be a bad word in our culture today. Now, look, I'm not the old guy that says, ain't nobody works like I did when I was growing up. I realize that every generation does that. And when you get older, um, you know, maybe it's that you're, you know, wanting to feel needed or whatever. And, and, you know, my grandpa used to tell me when he was my age, he could like lift a horse with one hand, you know, that kind of stuff, you know. Went up to, went to school uphill both ways, walked barefooted in the snow. We didn't have shoes. We were just thankful we had feet, you know. I don't mean that. You got to teach your kids the value of work, though. Uh, work is from God. Did you know that work is not a part of the curse? Read the book of Genesis. God gave work to Adam and Eve to subdue and to lead the creation before the fall. This was a blessing from God. Now, after the curse, work became much more difficult. But understand this, that if you don't have a purpose and you don't have something to do, you think that that would make you happy, but it does not. Did you know that studies show that people who don't have anything important to do, no responsibilities, are some of the most miserable people on the planet? Teach your kids the value of work. Listen to 2 Thessalonians 3, 10 to 12. This is Paul speaking. He said, while we were with you, we used to tell you whoever refuses to work is not allowed to eat. Wow, that's pretty strong, isn't it? Okay, you don't work, you don't eat. We say this because we hear that there are some people among you who are lazy. They live lazy lives and who do nothing except meddle in other people's business. It's as if he knew that Twitter and Facebook was going to exist one day. Hello. Anybody here saying, uh, oh, me instead of amen? You know what I'm talking about? It's like he knew that Netflix was going to be here. And he says, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we command these people and warn them to lead orderly lives and to work to earn their own living. Now, Paul was not saying that it's wrong to be entertained or to rest. But he was saying that we've got to learn the value of work. Teach your kids that. Number two, work is, from, is for God. It's not only from God, it's for God. Listen to Colossians 3.23. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as though you were working for the Lord and not for people. That's what God is commanding us to teach our children and to teach ourselves. And then we must learn to do this, do our best as an act of worship to God. Listen to 1 Corinthians 1031. So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Let me challenge our young people. Or maybe you are uh, transitioning. Maybe you have a job that's not your dream job and you're working toward a dream job. You're working on your education. You're working on your skills. And one day you're going to get that dream job. Do you know what this teaches us? That even when you don't have the dream job, do your best as if you're working for the Lord. This is an incredibly important principle to learn. And I'll tell you this. If you'll get this principle down, you'll be promoted. You'll have opportunities. In our culture, if you just like show up on time and work just a little bit extra, you're going to stand out. So God says, do this as if you're working for the Lord. Here's the second thing. We've got to teach our children the value of money. We've got to teach them to work, but then we teach them the value of money. Money is simply a tool. That's all it is. Listen to Luke 12, 15. And he said to them, take care and be on your guard against all covetousness, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. Money is neither good nor evil. There are people who say, well, money's bad. No, it's not. You need it to live. In the culture we live in, I mean, I guess you could move out into the wilderness somewhere and live off grid and never depend on anyone else, but that's going to be a very difficult life. The culture that we live in, you've got to learn that money is simply a tool, but it's an important tool. And we've got to learn that our life is more than our stuff. We also must learn that money is transitional. You're not going to take it with you, but what you give to God, you can send on ahead. That's what Scripture teaches. Listen to 1 Timothy 6, 
17 to 19. We read this earlier uh, in an earlier message. It says, as for the rich in this present age, charge them not to be haughty, nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God, who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. They are to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share, thus storing up treasure for themselves as a good foundation for the future. He's not talking about just our physical future, but also our future in heaven, so that they may take hold of that which is truly life. Life is more than your job. Life is more than your hobbies. Life is more than your toys. God says that the things that we do for him, the money that we use to support the kingdom of God, the things we do in generosity, the way that we do good works, God says that builds a foundation for the future. Not only will you be blessed, but in heaven you're going to have great reward. That's what the Bible teaches us. Money is transitional. It's not going to be around forever, so don't put your hope in it. Money is temporary. Proverbs 27, 23 to 24, riches can disappear fast. Anybody ever notice that? Could disappear fast. How many of you got a stimulus check, at least one in the last couple of years? Raise your hand. Raise your hand. I got one. Just raise your hand, okay? You say, Pastor Richie, you took that money from the government? You bet your bottom dollar I did. If they give out another one, I'm going to take that one too, Okay. And by the way, I learned a long time ago, I'm not going to rob anybody of a blessing. If you want to come up and say, Pastor, here's $100 to bless you, I'm not going to say, oh, you ought not to do that. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to take it and I'm going to put it right in my pocket. <laughs> Riches disappear fast. The question is, how many of you still have that stimulus money? A few of you do. Some of you are like every, you got like uh, 50 cents of the first dollar you ever earned. And that, that's good, Okay. There is a great cost to being a miser all of your life, though. <laughs> you know, you can save a whole lot of money, but you have no fun, all right? But he says riches disappear fast. And so watch your business interests closely and know the state of your flocks and your herds. So money is temporary. Here's the third thing we've got to teach our kids. You teach them the value of generosity. There is great value in generosity. I believe you teach your kids to tithe. One of the reasons why I've always been able to tithe, even without question, and give above the tithe. Kim and I have figured it out that I'm not talking about the tithe. The tithe is owed to God. The Bible says in Malachi, bring the tithe. It doesn't say give it. He says bring it. Why is that? Because it's God's. But above the tithe, that's the giving above the tithe. We figure that in our marriage, we have given enough money above the tithe to pay cash for a house. You say, why would you do that? Because we learned that there is value in generosity. Our investment, you know what it's resulted in? It's helped result in some of you coming to know Jesus Christ. It's resulted in some of you having your marriage saved. It's resulted in some of you growing in your faith. I don't regret a single dollar that I've ever given. Once again, I'm talking about above the tithe to God. You say, well, what if you had kept that and put it in the bank? It's temporary. If I died today, I would take zero dollars with me. But everything that I've done in generosity goes ahead. And God blesses. So he says, Malachi 3, 10 and 11, bring all the tithes into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. That's the purpose. So that the gospel could go out. Remember, Jesus is the bread, okay? We're to take that bread, that food to others. And uh, try me now in this, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you such blessing that there will not be room enough to receive it. Let me ask a question real quick. How many got some room for a little bit more blessing? Raise your hand. You got some room? Okay. God says keep on giving. And and one day you're going to have to get to the point where you say, God, stop. Would you please stop it? I don't have any more room for blessings. 
And so God says that when we learn to tithe, he does that. And then, by the way, he said, I will rebuke the devourer for your sake. Can I just tell you this? You can believe this if you want. You can think I'm crazy if you want. Most of you do think I'm crazy anyway. But I have seen this happen so many times. Now I realize you can't always blame a flat tire on the devil. Uh, You get that? Okay. If you run out of gas, don't blame the devil for that. Just admit that you forgot to stop at the gas station. All right. Uh, If something like a washing machine or a refrigerator breaks at your house, guess what? That happens. That's not the enemy. Now, it may feel like it at times, but here's what I know. God will work on your behalf. God will rebuke the devourer for your sake. Often we don't even know what was going to come against us that God has stopped. I'll tell you this story real quick. When I was in college, uh, Kim and I both were in Bible college. We were studying for the ministry and I was working and we were traveling. We were in over 400 churches while we were in college. We ministered in over 400 churches. We were part of a group that went to churches literally all over the nation and so we were, man, we were, we were killing it. We were hitting it hard. We were trusting God. We were serving God. And, and I was working um, and, you know, making a little bit, of, you know, college student, you know, not going to make a lot of money. But I remember one time, and we always tithed, always tithed, always put God first. And, and there was one week where I knew that I was running low on money and I knew that I should give the tithe But if I gave the tithe, I was not going to have enough money to put gas in my car. Now, it wasn't a Lamborghini. It was a 1973 Pinto station wagon, okay? So, you know, about one teaspoon of gas, you could go from here to Florida, all right? So, but I knew that I, I was low on gas, and I was not going to be able to put gas in my car if I gave the tithe. I gave the tithe. Now, you can believe this if you want. My car was not only on empty, it was past E. You ever been there before? You get past E. Some of you ladies are like that. You don't like to stop and get gas. Or you stop and put $4 worth of gas. I don't even know why you stop if you do that. Oh, I'll just put $20. No, fill the thing up, all right? You don't have to stop as often, nevertheless. I, I didn't get paid till Friday. This was on Monday. I'd put the tithe in on Sunday. My car, my 1973 Pinto station wagon with wood grain paneling down the sides was past E. My job was across, I was in Jacksonville, Florida, was across the bridge. It was about 15 miles one way, so 30 miles round trip. I had to go to work Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and definitely on Friday because that was payday. Now, you can believe this or not, but I prayed. I was like, God, I don't have any money. I don't have any gas. You promise, and I claim this, you promise to rebuke the devourer for my sake. And so, God, I pray that you just let me get back and forth to work. I drove Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday to work got my paycheck, and got home. Five days, it was past E. Now, you can say, well, you're crazy. That's a coincidence. Maybe your uh, gas uh, tank or your your gauge was broke. It wasn't broke because when I put gas in it and filled it up, it went all the way up. Now, you can believe what you want, okay? Uh, You can say, I'm nuts. You can say, that doesn't make any sense. That's okay. And I'm not suggesting that you do that. I didn't have a credit card then or I would put gas on a credit card, okay? But you know what I know? There's power in giving. There's power in generosity. There's power in obeying God. We need to teach our children to tithe. Teach our children to help others. Uh, Luke 6, if you give, you will receive. By the way, This is not the word of Richie. This is the word of Jesus Christ himself. Now, if you don't believe it, that's on you. But Jesus said, if you give, you will receive. 
And your gift will return to you in full measure, pressed down, shaken together to make room for more, and running over. And whatever measure you use in giving, large or small, it will be used to measure back what is given back to you. This is the Word of God. This is the promise of Jesus. Teach your children to manage money. This is our last thought, and we're done. You know, you got to teach your kids to tithe. you got to teach them to help others. But then you also got to teach them to manage their money. One of the greatest gifts you could give to your kids is teaching them to tithe and teach them how to manage their money. My suggestion to you, if your kids work or even if they get an allowance, it doesn't matter, teach them, put some money in the bank. Teach them to live on a budget. I don't care if they make $20, okay? Teach them they owe $2 to God. They need to put some of that money in the bank, and then they don't get to go blow the rest of it. They got to save some and live on a budget. I promise you, you do that for them, they're going to be better off financially as they get older. Here's what the Bible says. You got to learn to save money. Proverbs 21, 20, the wise man saves for the future, but the foolish man spends whatever he gets. When I was in high school, I worked on my grandpa's farm, his tobacco farm. And I'll never forget, every Friday on payday, uh, I'd get the money and the, the people that I worked with also got money. And the people that I worked with, most of them, they couldn't wait for payday because they were going to go out that weekend and they were going to get drunk and they were going to blow everything they made. And, I, and I'm not kidding you. There were several of the men that I worked with that every weekend they go buy brand new clothes. They'd throw their old clothes away and they'd work in the tobacco. They would go all weekend, they'd party, and they'd come in on Monday with their brand new clothes. And they'd work in the tobacco fields and get tar all over it and it would be ruined by the end of the weekend. And then on Friday, they'd do the same thing. Somebody failed to teach them how to manage their money. They didn't teach them to save for the future. You ought to teach your kids to budget. Good planning and hard work lead to prosperity, but hasty shortcuts lead to poverty. Teach them about spending. Why spend money on what does not satisfy, Isaiah said. Solomon said, don't withhold uh, repayment of your debts. Don't say some other time if you can pay now. That's a good verse to put on your credit card statement, isn't it? Get out of debt. Learn the power of compound interest, not working against you, but working for you. You'll get ahead financially if you'll do this. 1 Timothy 5, 8, but anyone who does not provide for his own, and especially for those of his household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. So God says, learn to manage your money. Learn to save. Learn to budget. Learn to spend. If you'll teach your kids this, I promise you, they're going to live an advantaged life. They're, it doesn't matter what they do. If they learn these biblical principles, then I believe they will be blessed. And they'll not live with the pain that some of you have had to live with because nobody taught you this when you were young. And so it's very important that we teach our kids how to look at money, to work, to work hard, learn how to manage it, to give, to be generous, to save. And by the way, it goes back to Deuteronomy. He says, in your everyday life, teach this. Now, am I suggesting you should never buy pizza and splurge on a movie night? No. Am I suggesting you should never go on a vacation? No. Am I suggesting you shouldn't have a hobby? No. I'm just simply saying, learn how to manage what God has given you. And there are two things you can do to get better at it. Number one is earn more. And number two, spend less. Now, if there's no way for you to earn more, then you can definitely spend less. And you'll get ahead. And, you know, you say, well, there's really no way for me to earn more because I work at my job and I've got a set wage. I get that. But, you know, there are other ways for you to earn income. There are many. You can work overtime. You can... Uh, have a side gig, a side hustle. Kim and I have done that ever since we've been married. 
um, she has taught piano for years, ever since she graduated from college. Actually, she started in college. Um, we have, I used to travel and speak, and, and I got paid to do that. And that was a side hustle, a side income. It was for the Lord, but God used it. I, even to this day, if you go on um, uh, Amazon, you can buy books that I've written. And you can, uh, so I've gotten income that way. We've started businesses on the side. You say, why would you tell us that? Because I really do believe that if you don't do something, then you got to learn how to manage what God has given you, whether you do something on the side or not. There were times in my life that when I needed extra money, I would gather soda cans and I'd collect them and I'd go turn them in. You say, how much money did you make? Not much, but it got me, it got me where I needed to go. And so my point is, teach your kids about the power of money. And I believe they'll be blessed. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, help us to learn the value of our example that we teach to our children. I pray that you'd bless us and help us as a church to follow and take seriously what you have told us to do about reaching this next generation, about ministering to this next generation. God, I pray for our people right now that some, many, no doubt, are struggling financially. Lord, I know that according to what I've read, that the average family, because of inflation, it's costing them over $7,000 more for the exact same thing than it did a year ago. And so I get that. That's a struggle. I get it. And so Lord, I pray for them, that you'd bless them, that you'd help them to live by your principles, that you would help them to live by faith. God, that you'd bless them and use them. And God, uh, I pray that you just give them ideas and give them opportunities to be able to be blessed by you. And Lord, whatever we do, help us to minister to our children, to our teenagers, and to teach them how that you have told us to with our normal lives, with our everyday living, with our realness, with our transparency, with our authenticity, with our relationship with you. Help us to understand there are no perfect parents, there are no perfect grandparents, there are no perfect leaders, there are no perfect church members. But oh man, can we be blessed when we follow what you teach in the word of God. Lord, I pray for those that need salvation, that today would be the day that they receive you as their savior. And we love you today in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Before I step down, let me just uh, say we've got some announcements. We've got our giving to come. Uh, but let me encourage you, if you're online and you want to receive Christ today, I prayed about that in the prayer. You pray that prayer, give it to the Lord, and go to the bottom of the screen, and you can uh, react. You can let us know that you've prayed to receive Christ. Today, if you're in the room and you did that, please take the next step card and fill that out. There'll be someone at the door. You can go back here to the Next Step Central, um, and you can drop it there or drop it at one of the ushers on the way out, okay? So there are ways for you to do that. And uh, if you want to get involved uh, in our church, if you want to go through membership, you want to take the next step, Jonathan's going to tell you how to do that in just a moment. God bless you. I love you. Happy Thanksgiving, everybody. Hope you all have a great Thanksgiving this week. We hope the message you heard today encouraged you and strengthened you in your walk with Jesus wherever you are. If you know of someone that could use today's message, be sure to share it with a friend and also hit the subscribe button so you don't miss a single message. If you feel led today to give towards the mission and vision, you can do so by clicking the give button on the screen. Thanks so much for joining us and we'll see you next time.